Hi, everybody. I, I know that I look like Liberty White, but this is actually Alex. <laughs> um, so, uh, welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Um, our first hour is general discussion. Second hour is uh, um, something we'd like to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about public speaking, uh, particularly as it re relates to, obviously, events and personal and, and uh virtual events, but in general as well. So we'll talk about that in the second hour. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Taylor Sunderhouse is joining us and, and we're pretty excited to have him. He's gonna, he helped set up our IceCast server and he's gonna show us how he did it and how, how he builds IceCast servers. And so that's for streaming audio, um, which is the new video, right? I, I hear, that's what people say. So anyway, so uh, check that out tomorrow. And then Wednesday, uh, we're gonna talk about, we had a request to talk about animation for people who haven't done animation. So we'll talk about keyframes and inter interpolation, inter interpolation and all kinds of other words that I can't pronounce on a Monday morning. Um, and so uh, so we'll, we'll talk about those things uh, on Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, we have Richard Lavery back. Uh, he just finished a symposium. He's going to show us a little how they put that together. And then on Friday, Michael Camus is going to join us. Michael Camus is an expert in post-production in the cloud, among like a thousand other things. And so he's going to be talking about post in the cloud with us and answering your questions. And then, of course, uh, Saturday's education. Uh, it's a little different this week. Uh, we have the space launch uh, that is going on on Saturday morning. And so uh, what we're going to do is have a first hour of general Q&A, and then we're going to switch over to after hours and watch the space launch. So um, so it's going to be a, uh, we'll just move over there. And uh, we're really excited about what the guys are doing the legion of, of people working on this uh, product project. So, um, so it should be a lot of fun. And then finally, Sunday, of course, is the, the day to ask uh, questions about, you know, stuff. Uh, why are we doing this? What are we doing? How is it, you know, why can't I have this button here? Why, why isn't this working? So all of those things are uh, the kind of the office hours uh, cleanup. We don't put that on YouTube. So you have to be here in Zoom uh, to enjoy it. Now I'm going to throw it over to our host, Liberty White. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so oh, much. You, for... you double muted. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. Okay, awesome. Good morning, everyone, or wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us here on Office Hours. If you are watching on YouTube, head over to officehours.global where you can learn more about what we are doing. And panel producers, we welcome you to go ahead and get your questions in early so that we can get started with this party. Go ahead, Bill. Absolutely. Good morning, one and all. The Seven Scroll has our first set of questions from Brooklyn here. They starts with morning with the availability and prices of Raspberry Pis getting more ridiculous than gas prices. What other tiny computers would you all recommend for value? And he notes specifically stick PCs, B links, and so forth. Courtney. Well, since my favorite little B link, this one here, is no longer available, uh, and I like this one because it has two uh, 2.0. HDMI outputs on it. Uh, I've gone to a new one, which is called the Melee, and it's a stick PC. It's a bit bigger than the old or as the old uh, stick PCs, which are also no longer available. This one, you can see the difference in size. This is uh, called a Melee. I'll bring it up, and it's available for as cheap as well, fifteen dollars off. That be make it one hundred and eighty-five dollars. It comes with a if you apply the little coupon here. Uh, it comes with a full version of Windows Ten Pro and uh, eight gigabytes of uh, RAM. You can get it for well, this one's four gigabytes, sixty-four gig uh, internal SSD. But you can get it also a version that is uh, for eight gigabytes and. Uh, for about $24 more. So that's a good deal. I suggest uh, there's a, a website uh, called ETA Prime, which uh, this guy reviews a lot of uh, mini PCs and stick PCs, m mostly for gaming, but uh, he also has the Odroid, which is another single board computer you can see here. Uh, in a, and it, I think, is uh, still available in Chewy Box and the uh, mm, okay. another, the PyOS. Uh, stuff there. So that's a good good place to start if you want to see a lot of reviews on uh, and comparing them for gaming and for other other uh, activities. A single board computers there. Most of them run Linux, but some of them do run Windows 10. All right, Jonas. Um, one of the things that I started doing if it's just for the value and not the science is get some old office PCs like an old workstation or something. You can uh, get those refurbished pretty um, inexpensive. And then whatever PC you have lying around is a 
good value PC might want to throw some Linux on that if you have too much of Windows or just installing a new Windows system on it often also helps. Jeffrey. Do what they do, uh, like with the video cards. Uh, they didn't buy the video card, they bought the computer. In this case, uh, if you look on things like Amazon, you'll find uh, STEM projects where they build a robot, build a dinosaur or whatever. And inside there, at the heart of that, there's usually an, either an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi that you can put in there and make sure that it comes with the computer at, as, as you get the whole thing, because some of them will not supply the Pi or Arduino with you, but uh, that's a good way to get one and get one in a cheaper price. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas uh, writes as follows. Russia is nationalizing Apple along with McDonald's and a bunch of other companies, and China may not be far behind. What impact will this have on Apple? Nigel. So I think there's a huge difference for Apple between Russia and China. And I would tell you the thing about Russia is that most large companies have been planning for something like this to happen. And they will be taking a very long term view of where to position themselves. So the short term revenue, there will be some impact. But long term, they've sort of probably made their bets about where this is going to end up in three to five years and will be positioning themselves for that. So short term, it's revenue, long term is different. I have to tell you the story is completely different in China. There is so much IP that is placed in China. Uh, for years, people try to you know, use remote servers, do all sorts of things to stop the IP landing in China. I think most of our large technical companies are past that, particularly the hardware ones. And that is a much higher risk for them. I think it's also a much less likely risk uh, for them. Uh, but they, they've got all of these planned. To my knowledge, they, most of them have got really clear strategic positioning with the exception of one, which isn't doing much in, in China or Russia anyway. Courtney. Well, I don't know about nationalization, how much it will affect Apple, and maybe it will bring their profit margin up from 40% to 60% or so. And I guess for McDonald's, they're no longer going to be able to have a Big Mac. It'll be a Big Ivan, you know, so I can't see what I, I can't see Apple releasing their, uh, their intellectual property to a nationalized uh, version of Apple. Alex? Yeah, I think that be unlikely that Russia, Russia is nationalizing things because people already left. You know, so they're, not, they're not nationalizing things that are still running there. Uh, China probably, while it would be devastating to the tech companies, would also be devastating to China. Um, so the, these these tech companies form a huge part of their revenue and kind of the social contract between the Chinese government and the people is growth. And if growth stops, the government will implode. So so there's, so China will probably would not. Uh, turn off the spigot very quickly you know, if it did at all. But, you know, a lot of um, uh, countries are benefiting from a worry of China. So you'll see almost all the tech companies are diversifying from China right now. Um, so, you know, over the, you know, they have to act. This is the problem that a lot of us have. They have to act relatively quickly because within the next four to five years, most of these companies would be able to um, step out of China if they, if they did something that was um, a problem globally. And many of them were probably starting with COVID anyway. So this is just like, it's just accelerated the process. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens because, you know, Shenzhen has closed this week um, uh, and is closed for the week. And so that's that shock has a is a wake up call for a lot of folks who have centralized a lot of their technology um, in China. And so, um, but I think that the conversation of moving technology out of China is going to, this this whole situation in Ukraine is going to intensify that because most people think that Taiwan is next. Mm. Bill. Whenever I hear the word nationalizing, I think of it in terms of uh, those big industrial nationalizations where a usually a government power entity tries to take over the electrical industry or oil and gas or something like that. In the case of trying to nationalize a very high technology company like Apple, I can't believe that there is the intellectual capital in terms of entrepreneurship to staff and run an operation like that and not have it fall apart pretty quickly. I mean, Apple, if nothing else, they're globally renowned as being extraordinary operators. And when in the corporate suite, when you hear somebody saying, those guys are good operators, they're talking about all the minutia of running an operation constantly day in and day out. And it's very difficult to do very well. Operators are highly praised, and I just can't see that the Russian system will have developed that kind of entrepreneurial set of operators to be able to take over something like Apple and do anything other than mess it up totally. 
Alex. All Apple has in Russia's stores. <laughs> so, and I'm not even, you know, they have very little, uh, it, it doesn't really affect them. It's one thing to nationalize McDonald's, which is a fairly well-known process, and a lot of people have been trained to do it. It's another thing, as Bill said, to nationalize a technology company. It would, and again, I think that would be highly unlikely that China would do the same thing that Russia is doing. Um, they, they, uh, they depend too much on the market that depends on them. Next question. Jeffrey Reyes in the Bronx says, I hooked up a new Mac mini to a display with built-in speakers using HDMI, but the Mac OS volume controls become disabled. What is the workaround to controlling volume to an external display and or speaker on Mac OS? Jason. Uh, Jeffrey, I feel your pain. This is certainly something that can happen with the handshake. And what it means is that the monitor doesn't want any sort of software control. Your fix is Rogue Amoeba's sound source. It's got a nice little thing called Magic Boost 2 that is an excellent uh, normalizer, and it gives you all the controls that uh, you'll be looking for. Craig? Yeah, Jason nailed it. I was also going to suggest that maybe have a quick look in Audio MIDI setup. Uh, there's some some software actually shows up with an option there to uh, to allow the OS to control the output. But I think in this situation, it's probably best to uh, to go with the uh, software option. Next question. Ari Block in Tel Aviv, Israel is up next. He says, "Anyone thought of uh, any? Has anyone used the Open Switcher project? And if so, thoughts?" And he's got www.openswitcher.org there. Jonas. So the Open Switcher project, this is the website, it's an open source project to bring the ATEM software control to devices and platforms that Blackmagic doesn't serve and doesn't seem like to intend to serve. So this was born out of uh, the necessity of running um, the ATEM software control on a Linux platform. It tries to um, do the same thing that Atom Software Control uses. One of the interesting features that this one has versus uh, most other reverse implementations is that um, this one also works over the USB, while most only work over the network. And they implemented a TCP um, proxy server, so you can talk to the software over TCP. It's uh, it's really interesting software. I haven't tried it just yet, but. It's uh, on the list of things to try. Looks interesting. Next question. Douglas Carmichael has a different one. Any of you worked with the asterisk open source PBX in production? And if so, what have your experiences been? Jonas. One of the projects we tried to do with that is um, at the start of the pandemic, we had an issue where we wanted to serve uh, the church service to older people. And when we decided that it might be hard for them to go to YouTube, um, one of the things that I started working on is basically a line that they could call that connects them to a group call. Then they could listen into it that way. Um, we had a lot of problems with like the setup because we uh, like getting the numbers and all that. We had some issues with that and never fully made it work. And at the end, just used the commercial product, but uh, should have worked for that. Next question. Tlaloc, uh, Lopez, Miguel, Waterman, uh, Salisbury, Maryland, USA. Jo Jonas, can you tell us about your Pi Day promo? Jonas? Yeah, today to celebrate the roots of Playout B, since it a uh, software that originated on the Pi, there's a 30% off coupon code that should be in the mail of everyone that bought it or followed the page, and uh, it's also in the Discord. Very creative. Pi Day discount. Nice. Next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles is up with our next question. When using an X32 rack, should the IFBs for on-air talent go through the X32 or should that be on a separate system? Jason? The channels you're mixing are part of an X32. Something like, you know, the P16M would absolutely work. And, um, you know, if you want to go a little bit more fancy than that, then Midas has a really, really neat little piece of hardware. But long story short, yeah, if you're mixing the channels and you can separate them in a meaningful way, absolutely. And Alex? Yeah, you just have to be really careful. <laughs> so when you start mixing your comms, and we do this a, a lot, but we make sure that we have an audio engineer that really knows what they're doing. Uh, because uh, when you start mixing comms with the, on the same mixer as the program, uh, you definitely increase the risk of accidentally mixing the comms into the program, um, and uh, that can be a pretty uh, rough experience for you. So, um, so if you do that, just really, really take care to do it carefully. Next question. Noah Sargent's up next from Fullerton, California. Have, have you seen power over Ethernet equipment like lights, audio mixers, and other equipment? I've only seen cameras so far. 
Jason. Ubiquity does have some security lights that are, you know, just designed to to service things where you wouldn't otherwise have power. I think for the most part, this has been born out of necessity, and as a result, um, it's not usually the right way to do it. So people don't do it. Jeffrey. Yeah, I agree. There's only so much uh, so much voltage you should be going through uh, your Ethernet cables, and so uh, being able to power lots of stuff through uh, through a, a router is not totally recommended even though you can do cameras and uh, I, I probably would never do lights it just doesn't make too much sense to me courtney yeah there's not enough uh the standards for sending power over ethernet uh there's two different two different standards one is 37 to 57 volts and the other is 42 to 57 volts so it seems like 57 volts is the maximum voltage range and 600 milliamps is the maximum current that you can send over power over ethernet so that would probably rule out most lights other than little small led fill lights or something uh uh, you don't want to use it for large lighting appliances, especially any any that are going to be moving moving lights, like uh, you know that you have X Y control motorized lights would pull far too much current. Jonas, yeah. So uh, one of my encoders, the Epiphan Pol Nanos, use um, you can use PoE to power them, and then also Raspberry Pis. I saw a bunch of um, them being used as throwdown. So basically, you can just run one Ethernet cable and then have it sit there that BGH1 is powered by that and all the Dante little um, AVIO um, plugs that can convert it to USB or your XLRs are also PoE powered. Craig. Uh, there's one uh, box I'm really interested in trying out uh, by a company called Glen Sound, and it's a replacement for the old Fosex that we've always had backstage for for uh, video positions. Um, and it's a Dante enabled power over Ethernet speaker uh, that gives you four channels of audio that you can switch and mix and have local volume control over. Uh, that looks really interesting. And it's only POE. There's no local power supply for it available. Nigel. Yeah, in my world, there's a lot of audio and video distribution stuff you put around the house that's PoE enabled. Um, I have to tell you, every time we try to use lighting, that's never worked. So um, maybe it's the draw, maybe it's the devices, but that's where we live. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, in Andy's Office Hours 2.0 deep dive, he mentioned Streamweaver as the link from the, uh, cloud, from the, quote, cloud to the ground. What data is transported over the Streamweaver pathway? Jonas. Right now, we do not use Streamweaver in uh, any way to transport stuff. We have the universe set up locally at a, in the rack and then tunnel it out using a Cloudflare tunnel. And that's how we communicate with universe right now. What you generally can do with Streamweaver is you can send OSC, Outnet, or just a UDP stream. So that's the, are the options available, but we do not use any of those right now. Thanks. Next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada says, with the discussions about Companion Pi lately, what are your favorite uh, or first Pi-centric buttons you use? Mine was a power button to shut down the Pi from the Stream Deck. Craig. Yeah, I just wonder if anybody, is, anybody else has come up with anything interesting uh, when using the Pi headless uh, for Companion. I've done a couple of other things, uh, including having it display the IP address for both the, the wired and wireless uh, network of the Pi on the Stream Deck so I can access it if it's not showing up where I want. Um, and also being able to shut down, uh, this isn't a Pi specific thing, but being able to shut down uh, instances that I'm not using, connections that I'm not using. So just to cut down the bandwidth on the uh, on the USB bus. Jonas? One trick that we did for our, we have a little um, deployment with it is um, you can set up companion buttons that you need to hold it for like 10 seconds and you have a little countdown. And we replaced the normal ATEM go live with that. So that way our volunteers had to press and hold the button for 10 seconds before they could change anything to the on air. Next question. Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland says, if you were buying a small versatile video light for a single camera shoot, would you choose a panel or a tube and why? And he says, thanks. Alex. I, I use the Pavo tube for those things. Um, I don't like this small square surface area. So that's the thing that I kind of push against because it just looks very spotty. Um, and I find that the uh, the Pano tube uh, does a little bit of a better job with it, especially if I throw some diffusion in front of it. Um, I uh, I generally will 
go as big as I can you know, with most of those things. Or I try to lower, I try to get a camera that handles uh, natural light pretty well. Um, I'm a real, I'm, I, and I will admit that I'm super sensitive to spot spotlights, you know, so the traditional camera lights of being like three by three or three by four or smaller, um, just look very like news, <laughs> like, you know, I'm mounted on the camera. And I tend to do almost everything I can to avoid that. Jeffrey. Yeah, it depends on if you're mounting it to the camera or you're going to put it onto like a cowboy stand or something like that. Uh, several, you know, the, the panel lights, as Alex talked about, the Pavo tubes work really well. And with cool thing with Pavo tube is, is you can take it across as opposed to like a ring light, which especially if they got glasses on, can really shine in there. We saw we watched a video, uh, a, a call uh, last week where the guy had like three ring lights and they were all just shining in his glasses in different directions and, and that was pretty distracting from there so i would probably put if you can put it on a cowboy stand get it uh not center but off to the one side so you can get a little depth going and a little lighting depth going as well Jonas, one of the lights that i really like since at quest for what's for versatile lighting is Agata released a key light mini it's a small uh light that is battery powered but one of the cool features is you take it with yourself home and attach it to your Wi-Fi. Suddenly you can remote control it with the app and it's a quite a nice lighting for um, conference calls and it's magnetic so I can put it somewhere where I then can bounce it off somewhere um, and it has quite a lot of light output. Nice. Bill? So for many years when I was learning to shoot, I started with uh, Frezzies and other small on-camera lights. And the reason that I liked them was that they had ex accessories, including Fresnel lenses. And uh, there are more and more units coming out. Some of them are a little pricey, but they uh, take shore power and they have a Fresnel lens in front of a COB, a chip on board, single LED. And that means you've got a point source behind the lens, but Fresnel lenses are almost kind of magical. They soften the edges of light without changing its directionality too much, which means that you can use barn doors to control them. So um, there's an old Hollywood technique called an OB light, I think it was named for Merle Oberon back in the early days of the 20s. And that idea of being able to light just someone's eyes and have control over it, you don't get the terrible thing of those panel LEDs where if you try to barn door it down, uh, it ends up making it a Venetian blind kind of look. So that's where I would go. I'd try to find one of the small cob lights that's battery powered that has a Fresnel lens accessory. That would be my ideal on camera light. Courtney. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the larger is better, especially for us older people, because uh, it eliminates wrinkles. Uh, a good choice would be uh, this one, which is what I'm using right now, the newer 18 inch. It's a big panel. It's a, uh, great things for uh, a lot of great features for a single camera shooter it's adjustable in color temperature continuously adjustable from tungsten to daylight uh, it's adjustable in brightness of course from zero to 100 percent and runs on in type uh, batteries if you want and it comes with a carrying case and two power supplies for under 300 dollars. so that's quite a deal Alex. Yeah, and I felt as I was looking at it like kind of thinking of run and gun when I first answered it, and, which I would probably just do natural light for, to be honest. I would just use a camera that can handle that. Uh, and I have in a lot of places around the world. And um, But for what we send out, we typically send out Nanlite, uh, either 100Bs or 68Bs uh, with our single cameras. Next question. Steve Buchan of uh, Vancouver, Canada says, uh, understand the Discord profile naming policy, but on socials, many have a brand. Uh, for example, he puts uh, at that Steve. Can you add brand tag or socials to the Mikana profile metadata and allow brand tags for discords? Nice question, Alex. If you ask that on Sunday, I'll give you a longer uh, answer to that. Um, but in short, you know, the, the goal here is for us not to have a transactional relationship where we're trying to get marketing with our with what's in our name. It's to develop relationships with people over time. And so um, they'll get to know who you do, who you are and what you are uh, and what you do over time, as opposed to just looking at some kind of uh, hashtag. Um, so but but if you want to ask that on Sunday, I'll talk about that more. Next question. Ari Block in Tel Aviv, Israel, back again with looking for an equivalent of a video assist unit, but without a monitor alternatives or suggestions. Alex. I'll hand it to Jonas because I was, I was going to say I need more information. <laughs> like I was like, I don't know what, what part of the video assist that you need uh, to, to make that work. 
Jonas? I would just get the video assist because it's one of those tools that you we carry it with us because like it's one of those tools that can get you out of so many sticky situations. It's like backup for so many things. If you need a recorder, get a recorder. If you need a HDMI or SDI to USB capture, get that. But I don't think you'll find a device that is as versatile as the video hub without being a video hub. Because like from SDI to HDMI conversion, level A to B conversion, adding a lot, having a USB-C output, being a recorder for SSD, there being a playout device even, it's so versatile it's hard to find something without a screen that that's all that jeffrey you could uh, do a uh, mac mini or a raspberry or uh, not raspberry pi but uh intel nook and then uh, set that up uh, to do the recording then if you ever need to uh, get into the video to do any anything like that uh, you can do a remote control into that and i know courtney's talked about those little boxes that he has that do that, uh, um, that will work, but I'm not sure what those are called. Alex? Yeah, I think that would be difficult to, to do, use a PC for that, um, you know, it, it could record, but it would not be an equivalent of, as Jonas said, it would not be an equivalent of a video assist, which does a ton of things. And that would be hard to package stably into something on its own. Courtney? Yeah, you know, there are, you know, the cheap, cheap route. These are uh, little game recorders, game capture devices that uh, you can get for uh, under $200 that have HDMI input for capture as well as this one has uh, analog uh, component video and composite video. So it can record, uh, you know, st up to 1080p onto a USB drive, but it only records an H.264. So uh, it's pretty high quality, about 10 to 15 megabits per second. Uh, and it's great for capturing video quickly, but there's no monitor. It's just one button to record. There's no readout. There's only one LED that tells you it's recording and what resolution it's recording in. So uh, there's not a lot of feedback without a monitor. And I think most of the professional type recorders that will record ProRes or uh, uh, stuff compatible directly with the Avid uh, all have monitors built in at Atomos and, and the like. Next question. Next one comes from Hasmec, our friend in Cape Town, South Africa. WLM meters on desktop, very responsive. Using OBS or MIMO Live to screen scrape meters into Zoom meeting results in very, a, a very sluggish meter. In fact, meters are sluggish in OBS and MIMO Live on the desktop. The only change is an after hours update. Any clues as to what's going on? Alex. I have to know what the after hours update is. I, I'm not certain how an after hours update would audio hijack as well oh, audio hijack update oh well oh. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you for so. the translation <laughs> yeah okay yeah the, the, yeah so i was like the master hours, list of acronyms it. here yeah exactly um yeah audio hijack update um yeah that it's the audio hijack update it's probably trying to do more with the m1 or whatever are you, it, i guess the question would be are you running it on m1 or are you not because uh, they may be trying i know that they're trying to get those libraries synced up jeffrey you could also try an alternative for a little while, like Soundflower, uh, to see if there is any difference and it being more of a hardware than a, than a software issue. Next question. Michael Forrest in London in the UK. Thoughts on the after on the after office hours inspired shoot 3.1.5 update, better telestation and a Fenric frame. Alex. So Michael Forrest is actually the developer of it, and he's kind of part of our, our little extended family now. And so, uh, so we definitely want to thank him for making this update. So let me let me show you what he did here, um, which was, uh, was pretty cool. So it used to be when I do this now, I know this will seem simple, but what you're not seeing on these turns, you see like just the edges of it, but you're not seeing a lot of... Uh, uh, fra uh, faceting. So it used to be that you'd see little hard edges, hard edges along here if I moved really quickly. And now it's, um, it's now a, a much smoother edge. So it just is much more pleasing to the eye. Um, and then also there is the, there's now a, um, I don't know where, where, where I do the adjustment here, but there's a Fenwick frame has been added to the thing in this, in this framing area, but I don't, I have to figure out where that is anyway so um so anyway but the as far as the drawing goes i think it works great um the only thing i would do is i would i would if i were you i would when when you start drawing i would have it start at zero i would have it thicken within about 15 pixels uh just gradient up to two pixels wider than this current um 
uh, piece and then have when you let go, it tapers back down and it'll feel more like writing and it'll feel more fluid, I think. So that'd be the only thing that I would uh, I'd think about adding to that drawing thing, but it's coming along. It's quite nice. Uh, well done. Awesome. Next question. George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia is up next. Does anyone use the DaVinci Resolve function that automatically syncs the timeline for up to four cameras for semi-live editing in post? Jason? I sure do. And then I'll admit I'm fast enough with Final Cut that um, I will just export all the timelines and, um, <laughs> and go on my merry way. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, what applications would there be for stick PCs in a headless environment? Alex? Well, there's a couple of different things. One of the things that we use a lot of stick PCs for is CART. So CART is an in-room, uh, it's, it's showing the text, the telestrator, or not a telestrator, but a, um, uh, the captions. It'll put it on a full screen. And what we'll do is at a conference, you know, we'll have different captioners attached to, you know, uh, different stream text outputs. And then we use these little stick PCs to just kind of, we throw them in the back of all the, all the TVs and just have them go to a web page <laughs> and it puts it up there. And that's how we've done many large conferences is just a stick PC in the back. I'm um, just pulling that, that content. Jonas. Um, a lot of websites, stuff like uh, Slido, Stage Timer, um, often some test feeds. So just some bars with some speaking or something um, to test feeds and also um, in the digital world. I have a bunch of Mac minis that basically are stick PCs for me because they just sit in a closet that I remote into and just join our test calls if we validate Zoom setups. We have all of those join and speak their name and um, yeah. Courtney. A lot of them are used in digital signage. So if you want to set up an information system that sits behind a TV set wrap mounted on the wall, you can set them up to auto boot. Uh, they will come up and auto boot into a video loop. And you can also, they can also launch a little uh, server that's on the network in the background. And so you can get into them over the network to change the information that's playing on the screen and control the playback, put up informational messages. So that's, that's one of the most uh, uses for stick PCs out there, I think. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up again. He says this time an IT job posting from Sweetwater Sound mentioned Raspberry Pi experience is something nice to have. Considering the Raspberry Pi was designed for education, what use cases could there be for it in a professional setting? Jonas. 50% of Raspberry Pi and customers are utilizing them for commercial and industrial applications and they're used everywhere from like we in Germany we have a special version that is like with all the norms and all that stuff so you can use it in the industry one of the great things with the raspberry pi is it scaled like i started probably with the raspberry pi one doing a countdown for sylvester using python now i'm writing so software on that and it's a scalable infrastructure and since it's such a known one there's so many hats that you can take like from sensor hats to like monitoring stuff it's a great little cheap device that you can use for monitoring device other devices and also for like small series products so like if you have a little product that needs a certain amount of power it's sometimes easier to just go with a raspberry pi and you don't only have to think about a raspberry pi but also about the compute modules which is basically a raspberry pi on a little card that you then can put into a motherboard um, those get used a lot more than these as well jason a Raspberry Pi is shorthand for, do you know your way around Linux? Do you know your way around a, a command line? Um, I, for one, use the um, the Raspberry Pi directly to control an X32, and Behringer supports this. So, you know, th there are a lot of things that I understand exactly why they would ask for that. That's a really good breakdown, because like Douglas, great question is, I've just known it as a computer source is coming into office hours. I'm like, wow, there is so much that you could do with it. Alex. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I, I don't know anybody in education that uses the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so, so it's all used as glue for other things. And I think we always we also want to be careful about thinking about things as, as educational. I mean, one of the big things that 
uh, you know, as we looked at doing the micro bit as a good example, um, over this uh, last couple of weekends, um, I talked to some other folks and they're like, oh yeah, we use the micro bit. For, they're not in education. <laughs> and, uh, they liked it because it was much smaller, you know, than, than the, than the Arduino and that it had 95% of the utility of the Arduino. And now it gets the same size when you put it into the maker bit, but they weren't using it that way. So, um, so the main thing is, is that, you know, just, you just want to look at what the tool actually does and regardless of the market that someone intentionally, uh, planned for it. That's a good point. Next question. Matteo Bizzeri in ANSI France says, would love to know the genesis of Mucana. Alex. Hey, that's a great Sunday question. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to start, you know, doing a little less of the, uh, of inside baseball, um, on during the week. So if you want to ask those questions, uh, Sundays are great days for me to kind of wax on about how that stuff works. Next question. George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia is back up with what's a very, what's the very first computer you used and what did you use it for? And this will be hard. Where is it now? Jason. Oh boy. Um, I had an 8086 from AT&T in uh, 1986 with a 20 megabyte hard drive, which was outrageously uh, good at that time. And um, I took it apart for a fifth or sixth grade project only to see gold platters on the hard drive, which, which was actually pretty cool. And is probably at the bottom of a landfill. John. Sorry, I missed the mute. It's uh, Commodore pet 1977. We were at the CES where they actually sold the Commodore pet on the floor of the rotunda, the convention center, Commodore pet 1977. I have no idea where it's at today. Lois. He stole my thunder, a Commodore. It's gone, been gone forever. Nigel. So my first computer is a, a digital PDP-8 in about 1978. It was very old by then. We had 8K of uh, little magnetic cores and they gave us another 8K and we wondered what you'd do with the other 8K because that was just too much memory. Uh, the first one I ever bought for myself was a Commodore 64. Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the first one for me was actually, it depends on if you're talking about one we owned as opposed to one I used. Uh, the one I used first was the pet, but the one we owned first was the Commodore VIC-20. And then of course you have, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's the uh, one where you take the phone, you, you put it in the modem, and you use the typewriter, uh, and it actually prints it out on paper uh, when you went back and forth. That's actually the first technical computer that I used. Uh, way back in the day, and uh, the Vic Twenty is probably sitting on my parents uh, on a shelf in my parents' house right now. Nice, Courtney. Well, my first computer was in 1977, which is a Radio Shack Model One uh, with a tape drive for loading and storing uh, programs on it. But my second computer was an Atari 400, which I used to write a lot of software. And one of those softwares, one that Emmy back there for. <laughs> Uh, teleprompting. And I know where that one is because a member of the Office Hours gang here, uh, Robert Shoji, let me know that that he has it. And I don't know how he got it. He bought it somewhere. I sold it out of a garage sale years ago, and he ended up with it for some reason. So my that's Robert Shoji has my Atari 400. That is so amazing. Did you know each other at the time? No. Not no. At all. <laughs> the power of Office Hours, um, Bill. <laughs> Uh, so uh, mine, I, my first actual one was a little Timex in query, but I did nothing with it. My serious computer that actually changed my life is that one right there. It was my Mac 128 that I bought in 1984 and changed the entirety of my life. Mm, he's got awesome. a spotlight on it. I do. I think, and this is the first time I've used it. I actually have a, a I can blink it just to draw people's you eyes attention. You know, that is awesome. Oh. Was that a downstream key? I'm like, whoa. <laughs> no, it's a practical light on a switch. <laughs> okay. I was like, somebody needs to put that in the question box oh, there. He wins um, geek my, of the day. <laughs> right, right. Um, my first computer, I can't remember the name, but I know that it was black and yellow. So I think it was an HP, but I don't remember what model. I think I was in grade four or five when my dad got it. And it's at my parents' house in the basement, like everything else. So, <laughs> Lois. Well, I reread the question and it said, what is the first computer you used? Well, that would have been in the basement of the university, Hutchison Hall, uh, Burroughs took up the entire room and you typed out punch cards. Very nice. Alex. 
Uh, the first one that I used was a Radio Shack uh, TRS-80. Um, it was in the basement of my church. Uh, there was someone in our church uh, worked at uh, um, Unisys, I think it was the, was the company, and he uh, taught a whole bunch of little 10-year-olds how to program basic uh in the church was a whole he got a, he had a whole bunch of them there like 10 or 15 of them and we all came in once a week and learned how to program basic and, uh, and then i used that one i used another one my grandfather had one um back in 1980 and i programmed hammurabi which was the it was like this q a uh thing and then uh then my first one that i owned was an apple IIe. next question Next question comes from George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia. If somebody asks, what is office hours? What's your elevator pitch to convince them it's worth a visit? You have 30 seconds. Alex. I don't really try to convince people that, it, that that it's worth a visit. I just tell them what it is. I, you know, I said, you know, during COVID, a whole bunch of us started collecting trading notes uh, all around the world. It's a global group of people who um, are constantly you know, answering each other's questions <laughs> related to virtual production and media production. We've got 8,000 people as part of the group, about 4,500 get an email every day, about 1,500 are in Discord. Uh, we meet three hours a day in the morning and 21 hours a day in after hours, which is the geekiest water cooler in the world. That's what I say. The geekiest <laughs> water cooler in the world. That should be sold right there. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Steve Bouchan in uh, Vancouver, BC says, thought on thoughts on the HDMI capture to Thunderbolt or USB-A 3.2 for use with A7S, the Sony camera, I guess. 4K 60 hertz, a good spec, uh, or other considerations. And XCOOSP12HVC, any good? Jason. Expo? I have no idea about that last part, but I, I can speak generally about um, about USB and um, and Thunderbolt. The issue isn't whether or not um, either one can take the bandwidth. If you're using two three point or proper three point two, the the throughput is absolutely there. The issue is that there are so many ways to cheat the bus out of the necessary pipeline that I would any chance I have use Thunderbolt just because. Um, it, it tends to not mess around as far as the specs are concerned. Um, so yeah, that should be plenty. And if I were you, I would actually try to capture at a lower uh, resolution and frame rate if you're trying to use it as a live webcam, because you're, you're going to be spending a lot of processing power just refining the bits instead of, um, instead of getting good bits. Alex? Yeah, if you're trying to intercut this with gameplay or something, you might need 4K60, but otherwise, exactly what Jason said, most of your platforms uh, that are streaming, uh, now some of them, I mean, if you're going to actually stream something that is moving a lot, then 60s makes a sense. But if you're just talking, uh, you want to have, as Jason said, more bits per pixel. Uh, so you, the 30 frames per second is generally a better solution for you. Um, almost all of them run at 30, no matter what you send them. So if you're streaming, if you give it 24, 25, or 60, you get 30. Now you can set some of the gaming platforms and YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth to 60. But again, you have, you're have you not getting much more bandwidth. You're just getting mostly more frames. Jonas? I would try to choose one that allows you to specify a lower spec. For, for example, if you go into Zoom, I just had a weird problem um, with a client of mine. They were running in, I think, 60 FPS into Zoom, and Zoom tried and tried and tried to get all the frames out. And at one point, uh, sync with audio and video just walked away as Zoom was delivering more and more frames over 30 that they just couldn't, didn't know how to handle. So I would try to get something that allows you to adhere to any spec that a video platform has. So if you want to go out to Teams, use 720p. If you want to go out to um, something else like Zoom, use 1080p. And that is really, that, that is really helpful, I find. Um, That's a great cheat, cheat sheet there. Alex? And if you're OK with uh, 30p as, as opposed to 60p at 4K and 1080 60p, uh, I would take a look at the Elgato uh, link. It, we've had a lot of success with those as little like little capture devices. It's a little less than the one that you posted there. And uh, probably it's more well known to us. Next question. Lois Richter here on the panel from Davis, California says this being pie day 3.14 type. Anyone want to chime in on their favorite pie to eat? Alex. A really well made pumpkin pie or rhubarb is are, are those are my two favorites. Bill. We talked about this before the show, boysenberry, and it's because I think it was hybridized over in uh, Knott's Berry Farm in California. And I went there as a kid and uh, we fell in love with it. So my mom actually learned to make it. Craig. 
A raspberry rhubarb pie. Jason? I adore pumpkin pie. There's something about um, growing up in northeastern Ohio and like it's just the feeling of um, of the harvest, but I'm going to break the rules and say quiche, green bean quiche is my very favorite. Oh, that sounds scrumptious. So I'm going to say apple pie, a good hot apple pie with ice cream. But then since being in the South, sweet potato pie, like you just can't go wrong <laughs> with sweet potato pie in the South. Uh, Nigel? I have to say I'm more a pudding person. I don't know if that applies. <laughs> we'll take it. Lois? So my husband makes a custard based pie with whatever fruit you want in it. So I have raspberry pie or blueberry pie or whatever. So custard pie. Courtney? And being from the South, a good old pecan pie with uh, ice cream on top, a la mode. You can't beat it. Yes, I'll, I'll plus one on that one, Courtney. Next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California says, when putting 10 or more Pelican cases on a flight, is a rock and roller cart a good cost-effective solution? And if so, should it be put in a large suitcase to keep it from getting damaged? Alex. Yeah, the, the rock and roller is a okay cost-effective solution. It is, it, it's fine. I, I've owned many rock and rollers and destroyed almost all of them. Um, and so uh, the, the flights aren't what kill the rock and rollers. Uh, it's the it's the cases. <laughs> you know, so the, it's the cases and the transport. Um, and eventually you'll lose the wheels. Yeah. Or, or the extender will come apart, um, if, especially if you have 10 cases that are reasonably filled. Like 10 cases to me means 10, 16, 50s uh, that are at 70 pounds. And so you're putting like 750,000, 700, 000, 700 50 pounds on it. So um, I, uh, so you don't, I wouldn't worry about it. The one problem with the rock and rollers is they swing open. So you need to have a zip tie to keep them closed, um, you know, or something that is going to close them when you pack them. Otherwise they, they tend not to stay. They kind of flutter. Um, the not cost effective uh, solution, which is what is the standard that we've used for a long time are the cart masters. They are much more expensive than the rock and rollers and they are worth it. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. They're so great. They fold up. They're built like tanks, and they can be either a um, dolly or a or a cart. Jeffrey, oh, I think you took put his hand Jeffrey. down. Yeah, I took my hand out. But I oh. will say that uh, I will I will add that you can also do the rental thing. Go to go to uh, go to the hardware store uh, and actually purchase if if uh, you just don't want to do any type of the travel because that might actually be the more cost effective solution. Copy that. To our producers, if you have any questions that you have been thinking about asking but not quite sure, we're here. Go ahead and pop them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next again with, uh, with ETC introducing the EOS Apex lighting consoles with plenty of tactile controls. Could you see ETC being a viable competitor to the Grand MA2 or 3 in the live concert or event market? Alex? While we see plenty of grand MAs, um, we also see plenty of ETCs. I think they're already competitive. You know, like they're not, you know, there's definitely, I think that Tlaloc would probably be a better person to answer this question than, than I am, but I can just tell you from experience of looking over someone's shoulder, um, we, we see plenty of, of both solutions. Next question. Liberty White in Atlanta says, since we're reminiscing, what was your first live stream or video shoot? Alex? So we, uh, we'll, we'll go with live streaming. Um, we, I told somebody that I could live stream to, I, I think it was Ustream or something like that. And I had never done it. And it was, you know, I didn't charge, I wasn't charging them for it. So it was like, oh yeah, we'll come down and bring, we'll bring a laptop and a webcam on a cable. And this was probably 2005 or six. And we, and we, um, and, uh, and it was just kind of a, it was a, some kind of party at a bar. It was, it, the audio was all over the place. It was, it was a horrible thing. And the only thing that made it, the only thing that made it better was that we didn't charge them for it. Cause I, I you know, I kind of, I don't charge th for things I don't know how to do. So, so the, um, uh, so anyway, so that was, that was it. It, it, it showed up. What was funny was they thought it was great. Like they thought it went really well. Like I talked to them later and they were like, Oh, that was great. We had a great time. People saw that there was, you know, 44 people watching and we were really excited. And so it, it, it they didn't take it as a disaster, but I will t tell you that that smack in the nose of, wow, I do, I don't know what I'm doing made me become very obsessed within a week. I was like, I'm gonna be the best at this. I'm gonna figure this all out. And, and so it definitely had me focus a, much, a lot more on it because of that. Jonas. My first ever live stream was to Twitch doing Minecraft Let's Plays. 
after doing them a while on YouTube. And my first of all video shoot probably was um, started a little YouTube channel with a friend of mine and we wanted to do news and like weekly videos, but all videos that we ever published were announcement of the video for the next week without ever doing what we announced. And then probably um, real video production, I started with the church. Uh, we had some events that we did and then kind of slept into that. Jason. My first, my live streaming obsession began, began in 2005. Um, I didn't have the bandwidth. I was using a Motorola Canopy technology. And for anyone who's ever used it, it is very sight to sight, very directional, kind of microwave-esque type um, Wi-Fi. And I spent so much time talking to the ISP. They actually let me do my broadcasts from their office because they couldn't give me enough bandwidth um, and, and make sure that it was up all the way. And um, I've been doing a weekly radio show ever since. So yeah, it's been a while. Wow. Courtney. Well, I probably have everyone beat. Uh, mine comes back to 1967. I was a cameraman on a live production of Julius Caesar. Uh, we had uh, Dumont cameras with rack over lenses, and it was memorable because one of the other camera operators, not me, was moving the camera quickly from one location to the to the next setup and hit a cable on the uh, with the tripod and the camera, which weighs about 250 pounds, went straight lens went through the floor, which had a wooden floor, <laughs> the longest lens did. Wow. Jeffrey. Uh, well, the first one that I was part of was back in the 90s in college when uh, we recreated, it was a it was a class where we actually talked about MTV, which was interesting. But uh, we recreated uh, Bad Company's Shooting Star uh, as a video as one of the projects. And then my first actual video production was actually in 2000 when I was working for state government. We were actually doing, uh, redoing all the uh, all the explainer videos for uh, for our area uh, because everything was from the 1960s and and the the clothing just was way out of out of out of time there and then of course my first live stream was actually 15 years ago when Ustream started uh, and uh, of course we did uh, similar uh, we're, we're taking uh, cam twist and then putting the video in one corner putting the chat in, in, on the side and all the little uh, graphics in lower thirds and it definitely looked like a GeoCities uh, page if you looked at it so I'm glad that I've uh, progressed from there. Bill. So I had uh, taken a tax refund and bought a low eight camcorder back in the day. And we were doing posters for the local mall because I have that Mac that I have had for such a long time. We'd started doing little desktop publishing stuff. And one Saturday morning, I got a panic call from the people who ran the mall saying, Bill, did you, do you, you have a camera, right? And I said, yeah, I have a little video camera. He said, you've got to come out. It turns out that the management, the, the general manager of the mall used to play for the Yankees and he'd invited his buddy to come out, Mickey Mantle. And they had 100,000 people show up around the mall and they desperately wanted to turn something into a little promo piece that they could go in for the mall marketing thing of the year. So I grabbed my camera and I went out, shot, 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 came back to my office. I didn't have anything to edit with. So I rented a little Sony EVO 9700, which was this weird little dual well tape deck thing where you put it in one side and a blank tape in the other and you made things. I had so much fun and I got paid a reasonable amount of money for the time, like probably 700 bucks, which was amazing to me. And I just got fell in love with the whole thing and never looked back in terms of doing video. Yeah, I think I had a, a low eight two, possibly I can't remember, but it was my first video was uh, my mentor. So when I first came to the US and I was in Dallas, my mentor would do this charity event. And so she had all these notable people around the city. I was just like, I'll just follow around and I'll just capture content. That was my mindset. And then uh, just the idea of, OK, well, let's edit. And at this point, it was there used to be like these uh, CD ROMs where it would have some kind of editing program. I can't even remember. Now I need to like look up some of this information, but I like taught myself how to edit off of the CD-ROM and just had these promo videos of like the police chief and whatnot. So I'd say that was like my first editing streaming, just like Jeffrey, you stream. And it was just going around the city to different startup events and capturing these events because the startup community was really new and nobody, you know, giving exposure. I think Alex had a, a quote last week of, you know, go find people without equipment. And that's exactly what I did. Lois. 
Well, live stream is a new term, and we started in the 90s doing uh, cable TV. But it was a video production, and it was exciting and new. And being non-professional, we got to do all sorts of things. You know, there was the day I decided not to, not to show my face, so we just did silhouettes for the whole show. It was, we had fun. I miss that. Yeah, the creativity side. Next question. Next one comes from uh, Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York. Are there any more broadcast of the more broadcast comms apps that are better than Unity? Talking about solutions from RTS or ClearCom or so forth. Alex. I will say that I vastly uh, prefer the ClearCom uh, app over the Unity app, um, primarily because it allows you to have more than six PLs on one page. You can have up to 24 um, on an iPad, you know, and you can, I think you can even have more than that. You just scroll through them. And so you have lots of PLs, uh, inter, you can have intermix between, you have all the buttons and those buttons can be direct or PLs. You don't have to go to another page to figure it out. Um, it's way better. It's way more expensive too. <laughs> so, so if you're doing it, you know, putting up a server that's going to let you do, um, you know, the, the HNIC, which is what ClearCom builds, uh, it is going to be, is going to cost you more money. Um, I don't think that the other ones are particularly competitive as far as an app goes. Um, but you know, the, to get started with a ClearCom is probably going to cost you 20 grand. I mean, it's not, it's not a, it's not kind of a quick and easy one that I know of. Um, Unity is a lot more cost effective, but the ClearCom app is the, um, is the high water mark right now for comms apps. Next question. George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia is up next. Is the OWL, the automated camera operator, a bad idea or a poor implementation of a good idea? Alex? You'll never get a good video quality from that design. <laughs> Like, like, there's no way to do that. The OWL is a, it's a 360 cam that is now, it's just selecting a part of its 360 image and streaming it out. Um, there are, at any re relatively in, uh, useful costs, there are so many problems with optics, resolution, all kinds of other things that it'll, it'll you know, it will be usable, but not particularly fun to, fun to look at. I would rather listen to people than look at that video. Um, and so, uh, so that, you know, I think that that's the, the real problem. If you're just having, all it's really good for is talking heads because you won't be able to see the, the, the white, the whiteboard, um, you know, really, you know, figure it out. And if you're just going to have talking heads and it's going to be all soft and not great, um, why don't you just, they just turn their camera off and we can just talk on, you know, we don't need to see them at that point. So, um, so I, you know, I just keep on coming back to, you know, video is easy to make or easy to watch, but almost never both. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Bray, California, says, what trade shows are you seeing promotions for and any new messages being tried? Alex? I feel like I'm told every day when NAB is coming. Like I'm, I get an email like, NAB is only 14 days away. Now it's only Likewise. 13 days away. There's like these, all, all these, these emails. They are really trying to make sure that we don't forget that NAB is coming. Uh, I don't I haven't found any that are particularly effective that have me want to go to conferences any more than I did before, but I'm kind of out of that game. Yeah, likewise, the NAB emails just yeah. pouring in. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I, I keep, because it's the industry, I, I keep getting the emails, but I'm like two seconds away from unsubscribing because I get so many, so many emails from NAB. Jeffrey? Yeah, so uh, uh, South by Southwest is actually happening right now. So get a lot of stuff from there concurrently, which is really interesting. I don't know why they did it the same week, but uh, uh, social media marketing world is happening in San Diego right now. And, uh, and the reason why I say that is because they're, they're basically conflicting with each other. Otherwise, uh, there's a lot of small little conferences and, uh, and, and then bigger ones. Uh, uh, of course, Infocom, which I'm going to be speaking at, which is in June. As for uh, new fun ways message to bring the message across. I have not seen anything or heard anything uh, that uh, that's been innovative. Uh, it's just basically, you know, go to your social uh, networks and say, hey, I'm going to be speaking at this event or I'm going to be going to this event. Here's my discount code. They should go back and watch our, our episode from last Monday. <laughs> Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is up next with what combo calendar and or data repository do you use to organize yourself and catalog important information? And he notes uh, OneNote and Evernote in here. Jason? Oh boy, I'm highly ADHD and I have tried them all. I always come back to calendars. I am obsessed with Apple's notes and I am obsessed with reminders and timers on here. Without this, I would be completely lost. Alex? 
Yeah, like Jason, I I don't I don't do have a cross platform experience, uh, and so uh, if you are only on the Apple platform, uh, Notes and Calendar, everything has to fit into Notes, Calendar, and Mail because I'm just not willing to do anything that will get outside of the ecosystem that does all the notifications that are needed. When I I don't I turn them off most of the time, but when I turn them on. I just want them to work. <laughs> so, and so, uh, you know, Apple may have less features in certain places, but it just works, you know. Courtney. Yeah, I don't like the walled garden thing. So I l like to work cross platform. And so I use Google Calendar and Google Drive, which is, seems to be universal, works with all platforms and uh, works well in Chrome, which seems to be the browser of choice across all platforms. Next question. Fleety in Bali, Indonesia is up next. She says, what's a solid low cost way of monitoring our uplink to social platforms? I'm using ping plotter. Any other options worth considering? Alex? I mean, we've used a lot of different things, but the main thing that we found the most effective is number one is that we stream for days sometimes, but definitely for hours and hours and hours before an event, just to watch the the behavior of the network. Uh, secondly, we generally run through a router that's going to give us um, uh, t telemetry of what it's, what's actually happening, and so if for our in our case, we're using Meraki's mostly, um, but it's uh, but those are that that gives us a graph of everything that's happening while it's happening. Next question, Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. What's the best platform for a playout B PC or Raspberry Pi? Jonas. It really depends on your use case. If you have like a simple looping background video that you don't do a lot of changes, um, the Pi is a great platform for that. If you can get any right now, a Raspberry Pi in Germany is up to 200 uh, euros per piece, which is crazy. Please don't buy a Pi at 200 euros. I, hopefully they'll get cheaper. Um, you can run it on whatever system you have available after that. PC, Mac mini, um, they work really well. Um, we are building some integrations and the PC is nice because I know it. So like Player B was always built on the PC, but it runs as well on the Mac. And there's some nice features that the Mac adds that the PC doesn't have, but from the Player B side, all of them have feature purity and the Raspberry Pi should get its update soon. Next question. Next one comes from Brandon uh, Buttram in Indianapolis, Indiana. Can the panel suggest any places other than eBay and Craigslist where I might be able to find used equipment currently on the hunt for a Heil PR40 and a camera with clean HDMI out that's not a repurposed smartphone? Craig. Uh, for audio gear, you can look at Reverb. Reverb.com is a good, uh, a good place. John. Um, I like uh, Facebook uh, Marketplace. The reason why I like Facebook Marketplace is because you can see the history of the of the seller, and so you can go on their page and see if it's a real person or not. Bill, yeah, I was going to say Reverb as well for audio things specifically. I bought most of my used microphones and things like that, and it's a good community, and you can communicate with the people up front and know kind of that they are enthusiasts, not just somebody trying to hawk merchandise. And sometimes that's the problem with eBay and and Facebook Marketplace and those things is you get people who are trying to make a living off of it. Jason. Um, I love Reverb too. You can also, you know, wait for, you know, fire sales, just be on the lookout for them. You know, there's a place called the Pixel Core that like sold a whole bunch of stuff, you know, a while ago. Um, but no, I mean, it, stuff like that happens all the time. Just be on the lookout. Alex. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, B and H has a used area, and our friends at DB Store, uh, Guy Guy Cochran, um, have a used section. I would highly recommend it, uh, and go from there. Well, that wraps up our first hour of general questions. Thank you so much, and we are going to move into the public speaking conversation. And let it. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, we'll start with uh, open discussion. It was, I think, Craig, I mean, sorry, Greg Gibson had asked this question yesterday. So it was like perfect timing um, with regards to having a client and how do you prep your client? And then Alex tossed it. I was like, yes, let's make that a second hour for Monday. So we'll get into just the idea of how to prep your clients or even for yourselves of making that transition to public speaking. And Nigel, we'll start with you. Okay, when this came up yesterday, I started making notes. I'm going to try and keep this down to three hours worth of content. Um, <laughs> so a couple of really useful things. First and most important thing to me is 70% of your effectiveness is what you look like, 21% of your effectiveness is what you sound like, and 9% is what you say. So the first thing when you public speak, focus on, on all of it, not just the 9%. Second of all, remember 
you're here to communicate something. It's about what they want to hear more than what you want to say. And I think the biggest problem that speakers have is they focus too much on what they want to say rather than what people want to hear. Um, when you're in a business situation, you have got to learn to make your case. You've got to think through a logical way of making your case, and people do that wrongly. Something I think Alex said yesterday, which I think is very important, is be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, I try and look at the screen here to see whether people are nodding off while I talk. You've got to be sensitive and present to the audience around you. Uh, there's many more, but the last and most important is this is something that people do naturally. Most of the rest of us have to practice. Very good point. Alex? Yeah, there's a couple technical things to, to kind of attack first, and then then you want to start digging into the things. And I, and I will not, I will admit that I'm not perfect at, at many of these things, but but the uh, one of the things to look at is uh and uh, um and all those things, um, as I, I'd say I just did it right there. It's really hard and especially hard to do it when you're talking, when you're not doing a talk. So when you're coming up with something is when you're, when I tend to do it a lot, uh, but when you're, uh, see, see, it just pops right in there as a, as a as a filler. But it's something that you want to try to continue to work out of your system, and I, it's a constant battle for me because I'm around a lot of people that use it, and then that's the hardest part is not to have it drop into your into your general uh, way of speaking. So so that's one technical thing to do. Another thing to do is that the most important thing that will get over almost everything else is to be present. Um, and that's the that's the really the problem that people have oftentimes, I'll say that's the number one problem that speakers have is being self-aware while they're talking. And so they really have to be connected to the message that they're having, what they're trying to say, what they're trying to you know go through. And the reason that, and so a lot of what I do is I'm trying to weed out thing, anything that will create a distraction. And it's one of the things as we talk about public speaking, what we can do as a as an organization or as this technical support, we think a lot of times speakers are prima donnas, but it's really important that they're taken care of so that they can stay focused. And have, as a speaker, you wanna build up your environment so that you can be focused as well. And so a green room is really important because it gets things out of their way. And you wanna, as a speaker, find those things. And what do you need to request when you come? I, I, I would like to have this kind of tea. I would like to have these kinds of things because that pattern helps you, you know, get into a, a centered state where you can be present, but the best present that you can give anyone around you is always being present. And so that's the thing that, that and, and you'll find that a lot of times, even for the show, especially when I'm hosting, no one can even get a hold of me. You know, there's no way to tell me something during the show because I'm not paying attention to anything because I'm only paying attention to this panel, you know, and the questions that are coming in and, and it's all I can pay attention to um, and, and stay present. And so the thing that I notice a lot for speakers is that they don't do that. They're thinking about other things. They're working on other things. They're, you know, they're they're disconnected from that process. And it's a superpower to be able to stay present within a meeting or within a in a in what you're doing. Um, from a again, from a technical perspective, I'll also say that it's important to uh, when you're building slides as a, as a speaker. And, I'll, and this will be the last thing. We'll probably talk about other things in the future. But when you're building slides, the slides support what you're saying. They are not what you're saying. Do not put what you're saying on the slide. <laughs> now you may say, well, I'm gonna hand that to them later. Hand them a brochure if you want to, or a slide deck with all the text, but do not put what you're saying on the slide. And then definitely don't record it to YouTube. <laughs> like I saw one the other day, I was like, he's literally put the recording on YouTube with a slide deck with the words that he's saying. Uh, so, so don't do that. Um, like it's really hard because people are either reading or they're listening. They're not doing both, you know, and you want to just, you put pictures up and imagery that underlines what you're trying to say. Don't replace what you're saying with the text. Bill. So I used to work for the National Speakers Association and I went through a lot of, I got the privilege of being able to videotape and watch and rewatch a lot of the training went through. Uh, so these are some of the things I think about. First of all, you would be absolutely shocked at the amount of work that goes into what is a seemingly simple speech. In fact, if it looks seemingly simple, that's probably they've taken three times more time to create it than the people who it looks like they're struggling a little. Um, the other thing for me is there were three simple stages. The first was figuring out what to put in the speech because um, 
it's real easy to go over the the single biggest sin we thought saw with amateurs coming up to do their maiden speeches with they would run out of time because they weren't paying attention to time it's amazing when you get on stage how things can get away from you and you can look up and have five minutes left and you're only halfway through your speech uh so the second thing after figure out what to put in your speech is to ruthlessly figure out what to take out of your speech not just to pare it down to the essentials but also to say if i'm running long if somebody has a brilliant question what can i drop what are, what are the priorities what must i say and what are the last things i must hold on to to get to this audience to serve them then once you have those two things done and you think you have the right amount then it becomes all about relentlessly focusing on the audience and constantly monitoring them saying am i connecting and if i'm not connecting if i'm getting those pencil taps or they're looking away or doing anything that says they're not engaged you have to immediately go into what can i change to re-engage them Jeffrey. To me, the biggest thing that I've had to work on in, in, in the uh, last few presentations that I had was movement. Uh, so when I get it, when you get up on stage, the first thing you want to do is go to the center of the stage and know exactly where your center of the stage is. Stand there. Don't do the cha-cha. That's what I always do, especially when you say something you're not 100% sure of. You kind of take that step back, and you take the step forward, and then you take the step back. And you're just moving around. You're a little fidgety and everything like that. The idea, if you're standing on stage giving a, a presentation, you want to have at least three spots that you go to. The first spot is always the center spot. That's the center of command. And then, of course, the sides to address one side of the audience or the other side of the audience. And then always come back to that center and, uh, and plant your feet firmly on the ground and go from there. The other thing, uh, and of course, when you're sitting, making sure well, how am I going to sit? Am I going to sit with my legs crossed? Am I going to sit with, you know, uh, how how do I have to look at uh, if this panel? Do I have to look at a presenter? Do I have to look at other people, or do I have to look straight out to the audience? Uh, how am I going to sit in that chair and not look like I'm I'm watching the football game or something like that? The other thing I've I've worked on is presentations, and I I treat my presentations just like a band treats music. Uh, if you go to live music, and the band plays a song, you know within the first few seconds if you're going to stay on stage or on the dance floor and dance to it or go to the bar and get a drink same thing with a presentation they know within the first two minutes whether they want to stick around to that presentation or go to the bar and get a drink and uh, and you don't want that second half to happen so what I've been doing is I've been sidestepping the oh good morning how y'all being on this uh, in this uh, area today thank you yeah this is gonna be I, I get on and I do something a very succinct and uh, and start the conversation right there and I don't even put my title slide in my presentation until about five ten minutes into it because then they, you basically go oh yeah my name is Jeff and I got this presentation they just completely miss that but within five ten minutes especially when other people start to come in late uh, they'll get who you are and what your the presentation is about and you've had a small little lead up into that presentation so you can go and uh, command and looking at different people and pointing out different people to keep everybody involved and interested in what you have to say. Yeah, so you use that first few seconds to just like grab their attention and, and command the stage. Nice. Courtney. Well, rule number one is know your material. Uh, know exactly what you're going to present, rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, but don't over rehearse it to the point that it sounds dry. You could end up like, you know, this guy, Ben Stein and uh, <laughs> Ferris Bueller's day off Bueller uh, presenting the same lesson over and over again tends to make it dry. So you have to maintain at least a false level of enthusiasm with your, with your uh, speech. And uh, if you have to use bullet points or a teleprompter, rehearse with the teleprompter, rehearse with the bullet points so that you look around and you're not stuck and reading off of the screen or reading in one position and try and involve the audience. And the best example of this is, of course, TED Talks. If you go look at those, those have fairly rigid requirements. They're limited in time and you have to stand on a certain spot on the stage and deliver your speech within a certain amount of time and present uh, an interesting uh, topic to a live audience. So take some lessons from there. Jason. 
We'll add to that that Ben Stein is actually a wonderful public speaker, and it takes somebody with that kind of gravitas to to, to truly embody the, the boring speaker. Um, back to what Alex was saying, and I hope this comes up repeatedly. What's on your slide is not a script. I called those bouncing ball lectures in um, in college because it was, you know, follow the bouncing ball and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's just, it, it is absolutely the worst. The other thing, that, the only thing I actually that I would really add to the open part of the discussion is be aware of how you stand because it's it's how it how you focus your energy uh, my girlfriend routinely will will accuse me of power stancing and i'm like i'm not power i'm just standing here but but it's something that i've done enough that it just simply becomes natural and um that may take a lot of work um in my case it didn't but but it it, it is something to be aware of if you are nervous about other things just be focused and and be present yeah lois so I think that there's a couple of different ways that people handle presenting information. One is have a script, be an actor, memorize it, get your marks, do it like you're doing a stage play. And that works very well for some people. For other people, knowing what it is you want to say, but not necessarily having it word by word by word. And so you might just have a subject, you know, and a subject, but then practice it. Uh, if you can get, if you're going to do a Zoom meeting and you do a presentation, get a couple of buddies together on your own Zoom meeting and, and practice it so that you can um, be free to, to go with the flow, but you can also know your timing. And timing is, is really key if you've got a specific limited amount of time. The other thing I would say is that it all depends on whether you're doing it online or you're doing it on stage at very different ways. The words may be the same, but the presentation is very different. I like that part, Lois. That's what I was thinking too. Hopefully that even with some of the questions that our producers are gonna share is just dis making that distinction of like, yes, public speaking is speaking to the public. However, there is when you're doing virtual and I think that might've been Greg's question. So if he's watching, feel free to, to add that again here, like how, you speak virtually, how to prep clients virtually, how you speak on a panel, because there's, you know, there's just a different flow as well as that. How do you public speaking as a host and how you come across? I want to go back to what Alex had said earlier um, with like those words. And I've done Toastmasters. I, I always like highly recommend um, finding a good club because each club has their own personality. But those crutch words like saying like and the ums and it takes some time time to get that out of your vernacular because it's like you like see I just did that <laughs> when you're with in a comfort in a comfortable environment with family and friends what crutch roads might appear there but then when you have to be on camera um, also the the practicing and practicing and how much that really helps and when practicing also again if it's a public like in real life and finding people to connect like there's that there's something that happens when you connect your eye glaze so that you're just not darting your eyes everywhere but making people feel that connection that you have with your audience being really important as well as thinking through like when when you finish speaking what does the audience, what kind of impression do you want to leave the audience with? And building your conversation around that. But as many have said before, also it's it's how you move your hands. It's where you walk on the stage. It is, do you add, you know, a smile and just all those nuances that Nigel mentioned earlier that all plays a part in how, you know, how you get your message across. Uh, Alex. Yeah, one a couple of things. One that came up while people were talking is that uh, one thing is is that I usually get up and I say, "Hey, I'm not a very good public speaker. I need you to ask questions. Raise your hand if something doesn't make sense or something comes up for you that while I'm talking, and I will have a conversation. And if anyone's been to any of my NAB or CGRAF or other talks, you'll find that I drop into Q and A within ten minutes, um, and, and you know because I just want to have that conversation. Now I have a list of things that I have to cover. Like I, I used to, we used to do a training for the Pixel Core, which was two weekends. And um, on Saturday, we would have, I had a list of things that I want to talk about related to the industry, related to CG, related to video. I would just, we had 80 people in the room and I would ask everybody, what do you do? 
uh, why are you here and what, where do you want to go? And I, and people would just say what that was. And I would, and I would have a conversation with every person as we went through the 80 people. It took four hours and I covered all the information, but it just felt like one big conversation. Like everyone was just introducing themselves, but we had covered all that ground. So finding ways that are much more interactive that, that pull people in, I think is, is, uh, is super important. All right, let's get to the first question. Our first one comes from George Butters in Halifax, Nova Scotia. When you present online, do you prefer to sit or stand? Jason? Um, I personally, whether I'm on the air or, um, or, or doing live video, tend to stand. It, 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 office hours has been the first time I've ever tried sitting. So if you ever see me like shuffling around, it's because I am not used to having to sit. And um, it's just, just the only way to get the framing right. So bear with me. Lois? Well, I always sit. And partly because if I stand up, I'm going to change my my placement relative to this microphone. And so unless I were to switch to something that had a um, microphone on my body, standing, I think, reduces the quality of the experience because your sound gets weird. Uh, also, I'm lazy. <laughs> Jeffrey. Can't, I can't beat the lazy for um, so for me it's it really depends uh, the, the situation uh, for how I'm presenting uh, that might require a stand or a sit uh, I feel that standing gives you a little bit more energy and yeah you do fidget around but I've also found when I'm sitting I'm fidgeting around by just turning my chair a little bit as I talk and go back and forth from there I'll, I'll sit a lot of my uh, shows I sit because I'm presenting something, I'm pushing buttons and I'm doing everything like that. If I'm reading from a script, uh, getting, uh, you know, like pre-recording so I can, uh, so I can uh, uh, do editing later, I'll stand for that. And then I will, uh, so I'll feel, I'll feel the more energy come through in situations like that. So it really depends on the, on the situation from there. And of course, yeah, I will switch out microphones if I'm standing versus sitting. Nigel. Yeah, so I think if you're doing something like this, then do whatever makes you feel most comfortable. The most important thing you should be is genuine and present. And if you're more comfortable doing that standing up, stand up. If you're more comfortable sitting down, sit down. But understand the choice you've made will change the way that you physically move and what you sound like. I want to sort of add a codicil to this. I've seen all sorts of people try and sit down and present in a room when they're trying to be effective. If you are in a room and this is a physical event and you are speaking, stand up if you want to command the room. Excellent point. Alex? Yeah, I, I always sit in online because I have so much gear around me. If I stand up to what um, what was mentioned before, I will change my framing. I will lose focus. I will, I mean, lose camera focus, maybe actual focus. Uh, as And then I will also have audio issues. And so, you know, by having this, I'm kind of, I constantly am working on this is the place that everything's around me. Um, and I, uh, I find that to be easier to work with. Bill? So just a real quick anecdote from my years with the National Speakers Association shooting things. When I started out, I was working with not particularly uh, skilled speakers. And so one of the things he kept saying is you got to move around and use the stage and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, well, then that's actually better than just standing in one place. And then later on, uh, there was one speaker, Sue Hirsch, who was, cool, who was dynamic and she was moving and she really brought a lot of energy to the room. And I thought, wow, that's better. I think uh, good speakers really should use a lot of energy and move dynamically. Then we had another guy, and I can't remember his name, but he he was almost a Broadway level performer. He was singing and speaking at the same time. And he was huge and theatrical. And I thought, wow, that is the coolest speaker I've ever seen out of all these speakers. And then one day they said, we got a guy coming in for the weekend and everybody's really excited. And the room was triple packed. And it was a guy named Og Mendino and I'd never heard of him. And this guy schlumped to the front of the room. He draped himself over the podium and for an hour and 15 minutes did not move anything. And it was the most compelling, heart-wrenching, astonishing performance I have ever seen in my life. And he totally blew away everything that I thought I had been learning through the course of that. And it comes back to what Nigel and other people have said, be authentic. Whatever you have to present, present it the way it needs to be presented. And you can connect no matter what your style is. Courtney. 
And for online presentations where you're in a Zoom meeting or something, I prefer sitting down. A lot of problems with standing up, so you don't know what to do with your hands. You know, you end up uh, fidgeting and 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 not knowing whether to put them at your side, fold them in front of you, et cetera. You know, so if you're if you're going to be photographed, you know, a full frame, you know, head to toe, in, in a presentation, I prefer to be standing rather than the entire chair in the shot. Um, and also, uh, if you're going to be in front of a live audience, of course, always standing stand up comedians stand up is in the name because <laughs> it makes for a much more dynamic performance. You can portray characters a lot more easily and react, uh, and body language means a whole lot in the presentation of, uh, comedy. And just to add what every, what everyone else has said, yes, what, if I'm recording something, then I will typically stand because when you're sitting, you have to be conscious of slouching and standing. It just automatically gives you a better posture, a better presence. Also, it helps, even though I'm sitting now using my hands, I can use my hands much more freely when I am standing. And But for something like, yes, office hours, or if I am teaching, then I'm typically sitting just because there's so much tools and equipment around. Next question. Next one comes from Stu Buchanan, Vancouver, Canada. When participating and hosting a panel on Zoom, I've had a lot of success having all the panelists engage well, but other times I have issues with engagements. What are techniques that I can use? Lois. Well, if you have a panel and it's going to be open to the public at a certain time, but the panelists are together beforehand, you can get more engagement with between people by chatting as we do in office hours, and getting energy built as you go. And so that's one of the one of the techniques. Uh, as far as the rest, choose panelists that are high energy. Alex. Yeah, the one of the things that, um, you know, as far as that goes, I throw the ball really hard as a, as a, as a, if I'm, if I am the leading the conversation, I never ask open questions if I don't know the panel well. So if I don't know the panel well, I'm going to go, what do you think, Jason? What do you think, Lois? What do you think, Nigel? I, I will throw the ball to them. Like, and, and I usually, at least at the very beginning, um, we'll let them know these are the first couple questions and here's who I'm going to ask, you know, so, and we, we kind of organize a lot of that. Um, getting to having pre-show meetings will give you a sense of what people know, uh, you know, what they know, how they're going to interact with it. You'll get a sense of what their energy is like, those, those kind of things. You definitely want to meet with the panel before you get on. You don't want to have the first time you met somebody uh, be on the panel. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so, but you get a feel for it as a host and then, Again, a good host in a panel, especially people who don't know each other very well, will almost never have an open-ended question. So what do we think of this? Because you end up with people who don't know who to go in next and it creates all those awkward information. So, you know, and if you watch a broadcast show, it almost never happens. People will start to interrupt each other, but they will never, very rarely will a host ask an open question to more than one person. Jeffrey. To me, passion begets uh, engagement. And uh, if you throw them a question that they're very passionate about uh, and they, they know the answer to and they feel very confident, on, that, that kind of opens the gateway. We've been in many situations where, yeah, we've had to come in cold with people that aren't regular speakers. They, don't, they just want to do their job, but they've got to be on camera for this thing. And, uh, and you start out and they're just kind of, uh, I don't know, a uh, picking at your buttons or something like that. And you, you just find that one question that'll say, this is how we do it and go for it. And they, they grab that ball, they'll run with it easily. Nigel? Whenever I'm doing a panel or something like that, the first thing I do is make sure I have time with each panel member individually. I get to know them, I get to talk to them, I get to understand them, I get to find what they're interested in, what they're passionate about. And then I assemble the panel questions in a sequence that makes sense both to my story or the story I'm trying to tell and to the people I have in the room. And then I share all of those with the people who are going to do the speaking. So nobody's really surprised. I'm not looking to prove how clever I am. I'm looking to draw out information from the panelists. And that's the way that I've approached that problem. Great. Next question. 
Next question comes to us from Roy Myers in Bel Air, Maryland. And Roy says, is there a nice or at least effective way to tell somebody whom you do not know that their verbal phrases, the ums and ahs that everybody's been talking about, are so frequently uh, so frequent that they've lost the audience after less than a minute? Understand uh, that we'll have to leave a knife in for the event. Jason. Roy, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to do so in a roundabout way, which is it's not a dig about you. It's about the way that somebody needs to be right before they are on stage. If this bothers you and you don't have time or energy to work with this person, you are absolutely going to knife them because it's all they're going to be thinking about when they're on stage. Um, or uh, is one of these things that becomes a natural human crutch and it takes a long time to get away from that. If you tell somebody the day before, it's gonna be in their head and it's gonna absolutely tank whatever it is they're trying to do. I will answer the question though. I think the best way to do this is if you find yourself saying, um, or uh, pause. And instead of saying, um, is no one's going to cut you off. There's no hook coming off the side of the stage, like getting rid of you. Pause, because it becomes a dramatic thing that gives you a second and gives your audience a moment to go, oh, why is he stopping to talk? So there you have it. Yeah, so a little bit of a dramatic effect, even if it's unintentional. Alex? You know, I, I think back to the saying of, you know, give me the strength to change the things I can, the serenity to... Uh, to accept the things that I can't, and most importantly, the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, you you can't change anybody's mannerisms, as Jason said, right before an event or even a week before the event. Uh, you have to take a look at what they're going to do, and then you just accept where that is because anything that you try to correct in those areas, correcting the environment around them, their camera, giving them more support, giving them, putting things in front of them, making sure it's just right for them. And so they are, they're affecting their environment to hopefully improve that is something that you can affect. Changing the who they are uh, anywhere near the event is not something that usually works uh, very well and usually ends up with, at best, a stale uh, presentation and at worst, a lot of mistakes. Lois? I'm wondering if we could expand this question a little bit um, I'm in total agreement that telling someone something like that, telling them anything negative just before you, you put them on stage is, is, is devastating. What can we do to help that person overcome their O's and ums in the future? And so perhaps we could speak to that a little bit. And to my mind, if I have someone that I'm trying to train or help or mentor, I will always say, listen to yourself. Let, let's do a recording and then listen to yourself. And But I don't know how to, to change it once they have listened and decided there's a problem. I have an um problem myself that I have been trying to fix for 20 years, and I still have an um problem. Bill? It is difficult, but thankfully we do have some tools. And Lois mentioned one of them: audio recording. Video recording is another one. If it, you know, I, and I hundred percent agree with uh, what Jason said originally, which is basically never before their performance. But if you want to send them off with something that'll really help, tell them just do this. Give your speech when you get home tonight onto a camera. Stop. Go through it. And then when you see you are doing this, when you are noticing it, learn to deliver that same line, line at a time with no ums and ahs. Just break it down to literally phrase by phrase by phrase and have them practice the same phrase that they use without the ums and ahs. It just puts into their mind the idea that I need to watch and I need to send it, instead of doing it this way, do it that way. It is unconscious and most people have no clue they're doing it until they see themselves doing it on a video or audio recording. Alex? Just, just one note is that I, I think that there is a culture of doing long scripts that people memorize that they're going to put out. And I think that, that is kind of dying. You know, that, 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 that presentation is, is kind of dying away on stage of memorizing those things. Um, I grew up and my, my father does a lot of public speaking and I asked him how he prepared and he goes, well, I've got this note card with five words. <laughs> like, you know, it's just like, I have a notepad with five words and I, you know, I know the subject matter and I, and I just weave through it and respond to the audience and talk, talk to it. And 
uh, as when we're talking about public speaking, I, I know a lot of people are nervous and people have legal reasons. If you have legal reasons that you have to record it or have to say every word perfectly, then record it and post it. In my opinion, if you're going to speak publicly, you know, you really want to, I, I have spent the last 15 years streaming keynotes that are largely on teleprompters and it's, uh, it's really painful for the audience. <laughs> you just need to know that, like, you know, unless you're really, really good at it. And so if you're not an experienced uh, speaker, you should not read a teleprompter and you should not, like you should figure out how to know it well. But if you're not really good at this, it, I think that people think that it comes off well and it, it does not. Next question. Tommy Shant says, oh, what's the best way to convey to talent that they'll come across with more credibility by using their normal voice? It's hard for me to listen to office hours, to listen to, quote, radio voices in a format like office hours because they sound like a commercial. Alex? I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I just think that, you know, everybody should talk like this all the time. You know, so so I don't, you know, this is very confusing here. I think that we should do all of office hours like this. That's a really um, good idea. Alex, that's and a I great think we should idea. do even more of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. I was <laughs> waiting for that to happen. <laughs> well, oh, no. let's go to the next question. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, you should read it like this. Yeah, and then he waits. So. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't. I don't think there's. I don't think there's many many of us here that are doing um, radio Mitchell. voices. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but go ahead. Sorry, Alex. No, but we can. So so anyway. So it's so there's a lot of us. I think a lot of us have a certain way of talking just because there is a bunch of radio folks in the in the group, and so we're kind of used to how we manage our mics. But I don't. I don't feel like we get any kind of really heavy radio voice anyway. From from that, I don't hear that you know, the twist that we normally have when people start to listen to themselves. Well, I think too, that they're asking for, for events that they're participating in when people do do that, how can you convince them to not do that and speak in their natural voice? Courtney? Well, I think what she means by radio voices is, is a rehearsed, someone reading from a script, uh, where is there, you know, this is my normal voice. It sounds like a radio voice, but it's not rehearsed, it's extemporaneous. But, uh, and I don't think uh, telling somebody to talk in, in their natural voice, because some presenters, their natural voice, if you go up and meet them, they're very timid. They're very, not very uh, entertaining. They're not very active, but, you know, then they get out on stage and interact with the audience. And, and you know, you see this in, in evangelical preachers and in um, motivational speakers, uh, their presentation is highly dynamic. It is not conversational at all and very involved. And they don't sound like a radio announcer, but they bring an energy uh, to convey that energy to the audience. Uh, you have to be more than just a conversational tone. Jeffrey? And to what Courtney is saying, it, if somebody's reading, uh, and what we've talked about earlier, if you if you have slides full of text that you're just going to sit there and read, some people sound like they are reading the text and going from there more robotic than anything. Uh, it, just uh, practice, 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 and you don't read from the script and go from there. The one thing that I find uh, that people end up doing, especially if they're in houses with other people that are involved, is they sound a little bit more timid and a little bit quieter because they're trying not to to uh, to upset your, the other family members and things like that. So they they just kind of come together and and hopefully they're not going to disrupt anything else that's happening or or have the disruption come to them. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, when it comes to uh, stuff like that. And then when you get off uh, offline, you hear that completely different voice. Uh, yeah, that was a tough thing. That's also because of the camera because they're they're not used to looking at that small little black void all the time uh, and not getting feedback from uh, from other people as they're talking. Jason? Well, Tommy, no, okay. I'm sorry, I call back, couldn't help it. It's important to not conflate radio voice with speaking in a relaxed, but also um, interested and interesting tone. It's something that does happen naturally after you hear yourself in headphones in front of a microphone for a considerable amount of time. And if you're doing it right, then it it actually will change your speaking voice. I know that being on the air has completely changed the way I speak from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed. There's no way around that. Telling somebody not to do that 
I don't know, it's a backwards way of thinking about it. I think at the end of the day, if you have a high squeaky voice, slow down and speak, um, speak more slowly and it will automatically relax your voice and it will soften what you're saying a little bit. It's the best I got for you. That's a really good point that it just might be just even pacing how that can impact how someone comes across. Bill? Well, I just wanted to note that one of the things, since I'm the announcer often, I, the reader, other people do it on the weekends and other types, you know, I, I'm looking at, at my role as to articulate, and I say that in the technical sense, what somebody else has written in a way that somebody can hear it clearly. So I I don't slur things. I don't do ums and ahs and things like that. I try to interpret what they've written and then do the clearest version of getting that out for the audience so that there's no ambiguity about what's being said. That sometimes comes across as a little announcery, and I understand that, but I think the higher level goal there is to make sure that people get it and get it the first time. Lois? So I have done television shows and uh, radio shows here on our local public access, nothing big. But what I find is that when I get on stage or in front of the camera, or in front of the microphone in the studio, that my voice does change. And it's not that it's become artificial or that I'm putting in a fake accent or anything like that. It's just that I feel that energy of being on stage. And when I get done with a show and I come back home, I have to decompress for several hours. I can't just go home and go to sleep because I'm so high from what I was doing. So as long as I can talk to you and the energy of my voice doesn't make it look artificial, I'm happy that I have a Zoom voice or radio voice as well as having a normal conversational voice. Next question. Next one comes to us from Lois Richter, who was just speaking from Davis, California. What do you mean by public speaking? Is it the same in person as online? Courtney? Um, no, because you get more feedback in person. And in person, you hear the audience's reaction, and you can react to that. You, you know when you're boring the audience and when they're drifting off, because you can see them drifting off. And online, uh, it's the same public speaking. You may be doing the same speech, but if you're just speaking to a camera, uh, it tends to be a little more dry, and you tend to want to get your way through it. Uh, there are a lot of YouTube presenters out there that are really very good at presenting, doing it one man band, doing a, a, a video all by themselves, sitting in a little room in their basement somewhere, but can maintain uh, uh, an entertaining and active delivery that doesn't get boring, presenting a bunch of facts as they're reviewing some particular type of equipment. So it's, it's kind of a natural thing that comes to some people and other people have a great deal of problems with it. Alex? Yeah, over time, I've pretty much become the same everywhere. <laughs> like, like I don't, I've kind of gotten rid of most of my front facing, back facing, online, in room. I just kind of am the way I am, you know, about things. It's a lot easier for me to manage. Um, the uh, the one thing about the YouTubers is mostly their energy is really kept up through a lot of editing. Uh, when we work with them and, and, and they have to actually talk for a long period of time, they have a hard time because they're not used to actually saying even whole sentences in a row. <laughs> so they're, they're, you know, they're used to going this part, this part, this part, and, and, how, the, and how they put their how they you know craft their their piece the magic of editing yeah exactly <laughs> next question george butters halifax nova scotia up next is there anything that can be done to improve the quality of an earbud slash mic connection for a presenter who doesn't have access to a better microphone Jonas. Jonas. i think we might have lost Jonas okay there. yeah alex yeah, the main thing is, is that you can, uh, the, the best thing you can do is to soften their room. So if they're going to be further away and they're not going to have a high quality mic, you just want, you ask them to put some blankets up or put something else around them uh, so that they, it, 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 it's not as echoey. Um, you know, hard surfaces are much more accentuated when you, when you have a, a mic that's far away from them. Next question. Uh, Steve Bouchon of Vancouver, Canada is up next, uh, and he says, I think eye contact with the camera is key. Many of the panelists have this down. What are techniques to make this look natural? Jeffrey? So with me, with eye contact, it's uh, uh, as, as I tell people when they get on, I, I really 
accentuate the fact that they're not going to be looking at a face or a person. So if you're going to be presenting for uh, something that I'm going to record, I'm going to, I'm going to say, basically say it like this. This is a little black void. I need you to take a look at that. And I know it's going to be really hard to look at that little black void because I have to do it all the time myself. And it's just something you got to learn. Uh, other techniques that you can do is you can put tape or or anything around the uh, camera to make it look like you know there's something to point to look at the camera one thing that i do and i'll show you this uh, right here is i will take the uh the video so right now you're seeing uh, uh liberty there and you're seeing my camera and it's not in the right position for you but right now those eyes are right over the lens of my camera for me so i can look at liberty's eyes and not look at that little black void but to you it can kind of look like i am looking at that little black void the other thing is just don't read text because if like for instance if i'm looking at uh, the question here you notice that my eyes are not looking at the camera and if you have something that you have to focus on otherwise that will deter you from looking at that little black void right there lois so i don't have a teleprompter i don't have a separate camera i have my mac and right up there up in the top there is a camera so what I do is I get my zoom window and I position it so the person that I look at is immediately below that camera so I'm looking here but it looks like I'm looking here so it's close enough people don't really notice um, it'll be better if I did the other stuff but hey I make do Alex it's actually one of the key things with Zoom is being able to, A, have the, the film strip on the top is key. Um, it's one of the reasons that I hate using all almost all the other platforms is they put the film strip across the bottom, which pull, pulls everybody's eyes down. And so it's just, it's nutty, nutty, like it's a stupid thing for, for to not have sorted out. When I'm in the grid view, uh, I pull everything that I need to look at as Lois talked about, right under, underneath the camera. I do have a teleprompter, so I'm looking at it right now, um, but I it's too small. I gotta build a bigger one um, because the, the 12 inch is hard for me to do what I need to do in that process. Bill? So this has been a change for me because for the first really probably year and a half, I had uh, so much data going on uh, as the reader for the show that I was constantly looking off camera. And I didn't get, when we switched into the new Office Towers 2.0 thing, the, the variety of shots that I might be a part of in these uh, super sources. So I switched and I'm now using the square that has the return feed as my prompter. Now it's a little weird because it's about three seconds delayed, but it's more important for me now to understand that my face is still on camera. So I should maintain contact with that camera until I'm switched off of. And that's been relatively new for me. So part of it's just technique, learning the environment you're in and how to manage it correctly. Yes, Courtney. Well, I'm one of those people who thinks uh, that Direct eye contact, continuous direct eye contact can be kind of creepy if someone is looking me in this, even if I'm talking to them in person and they keep staring into my eyes, it, I, I don't know, it creeps me out. Uh, so eye contact here uh, in, a, in a virtual situation, a lot of people are using teleprompters to move their eye contact, but I like to uh, look away and then look back and establish eye contact, but only intermittently uh, by looking back at the lens. I don't have a teleprompter here. And uh, I think it, it makes people uncomfortable to constantly be staring at them, especially while you're listening to them and then talking to them. It, it, it I don't know, it creeps me out. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. How do you balance use of PowerPoint as a guide versus extemporaneous ele elements in a meeting? Nigel? So I know we all want to say to everybody, don't use your PowerPoint, don't read from your PowerPoint. But the reality is for some people, that journey from what the crutch that is to extemporaneous, if I can say the word, can be a very long journey. So I typically, when I find someone like that, focus on two things with them. I walk them through the deck and I say, number one, if you could only make one point on this chart, what would be the point you want to make? So be really clear to yourself the thought you want communicated from that chart. And then, by the way, maybe the next point needs another chart. The second thing I say to them is, focus on the transition between the charts. Help the audience get from one thought to the next. And while that doesn't fix the don't use PowerPoint, it starts to move somebody forward on that there's a better way than just reading it. Jason? Um, 
PowerPoint, if PowerPoint needs to be your guide, then the other people in your meeting should not be seeing it. It's that simple. If you need cue cards and PowerPoint is the very best way for you to do that, go for it. If you have no other way of doing it, I would say that most of a Zoom meeting should feel extemporaneous, but should actually be expository. What you're doing is taking what you have and exposing it for your audience. Again, try not to use PowerPoint because it will turn into a crutch faster than you can imagine. Just see what you have to say without it. And if you need it, then look very carefully at the quality of, of what you're trying to convey. Alex? Yeah, you know, it's one of the reasons actually that I leave, I use Keynote, mostly not PowerPoint, but it's the same thing. Number one is you can put all the things you want to say in your notes. <laughs> so you don't, you have, there's a notes section that will pop up while you're presenting if you if you set that that thing. So you can have it there. You don't have to read off of the slide itself. Usually you can set it, you can go into two, two window presentation mode and get most of those things done. The other thing is, is one of the reasons that I get rid of all the text on my, uh, and I just have images that's supporting what I'm talking about. And if I need notes, I put them in there. I don't usually need them, but um, is that I want to do this. So I have a, you know, and, and on both PowerPoint and Keynote, when you're showing it, you don't need a Telestrator like mine. You can actually just draw, you know, they both have drawing tools that allow you to draw over your slide. By creating a white, a lot of white space, not only do I make it easier for you to understand what I'm saying, I leave a lot of places for me to draw. So I can sit there and draw and go connect things. And I've now gotten to the point where when I do presentations, I put up images where I plan to draw on. You know, so I literally go, I'm going to put this in this. I don't put a connection to it. I'm drawing that connection in. And that creates a kind of a more interactive experience for the for the viewer or something that's changing a little bit more. It looks a little messier, but um, I think that it, it feels it feels effective and works in my head. Jeffrey. And it really depends on the situation. Last week's <clears throat> event that I was at, it was uh, they they used a lot of slides to uh, show a lot of things, but we're we're talking a lot of technical stuff. So we saw a lot of a lot of slides that had uh, processes and and code and and things like that. By the way, dark mode does not work on a presentation. It's uh, it was just horrible, but uh, light mode was was a lot better. Uh, but when I'm on stage for a regular event, I treat my presentations like if I was I had a children's book in front of me and I was turning the pages. So it's going to be very, very simple, easy to see pictures, maybe a little bit of text, but it's something so I can glance my eye onto the slide and say, this is where I am in the presentation. This is what I need to be talking about, and then go and talk from there. And then they have the nice big picture. We'll go to the nice next big picture because we're telling a story uh, with our presentations. Lois? I'm reading this question, and it said, using PowerPoint as a guide. If that is really what it is, if you're not needing to show it to the audience, you just need it as a guide, put it in a separate window or in a separate screen or even on a separate device, you know, prop your little iPad up and, and have your, your notes there. Um, it, is, it is distracting to be doing this all the time. So if you could make it so that your slideshow is right next to your screen, all the better. Great points. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, up next, when presenting to an audience with mixed English competency, how do you simplify your presentation enough for the less competent while not boring those who are more competent? Nigel. So I used to do quite a lot of talking in Japan and China, and I found there were three different ways it normally happened. It was a simultaneous translation, so someone spoke as I spoke. It was a line-by-line -line translation, or there was no translation at all. Either way it was, and by the way, my favorite of those is the line-by-line, -line, because I love saying a line, have somebody else do it, and then I can really think about what my next sentence is going to be. I can really practice it in my head. But either way, it's really things we've talked about before. It's about being really clear the point you're trying to communicate. Be really clear and simplify it to the core elements. Don't use complicated words. Don't use complicated thoughts. And go more slowly. If I was doing a presentation in Asia, it would typically take twice the time that it would do if I was talking to other English-speaking people uh, because I would really pace it through that way. Jason? That which I cannot explain, I do not understand. It is outrageous how frequently, if you ask an expert a very simple question that is in their field, if they cannot describe it succinctly, what you're seeing is this little thing called the curse of knowledge, whereby 
they can have a high level conversation, but they can't actually explain it to a third grader. That is the very worst way to do this. Do not hide behind your vocabulary. I've made a career of explaining very, 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 very technical things to people who don't want to know any of the technical aspects on it. They want to have questions answered about it. They want to know whether or not it's going to work. And that's it. I would say, if you can't explain it to a third grader, you're losing. Alex. Yeah, one of the best things I did is start to teach computer graphics and and video to to 12 year olds and and to jason's point sometimes eight to 12 year olds really and and it required me to rethink how i explain things and required me to really understand how to use metaphors and physical devices you know physical things to make it clear about what that means um, one of the things that i do when i speak overseas and i do a lot of speaking or i have done a lot of speaking overseas is to reduce most of my things down to much more clear nouns um, that are probably things that people know. It doesn't mean that I have to talk any slower or not cover the material any faster. It just means I use a lot less idioms. And I generally have gotten rid of many of the idioms that I've used in the past, uh, mostly because of the fact that I have to, ha it has to be understandable in a lot of different cultures. Bill? I had to get to the point where I understand that simplification is not the same as dumbing things down. Simplification is hard work often. It's incredibly hard work. And it struck me when I was reading uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood because the language in that is about as spare and simple as can be, but the imagery and everything else is incredibly powerful. And I realized I was reading a master at work. I mean, literally engagement through simple, simple language. The other thing is pace. When you're talking about people who don't understand the language clearly, um, my model is often presidential addresses are paced very re easily. They don't have a lot of words per minute. And that is because they are trying to bring along the largest possible audience. So uh, we're, I will slow things down a little bit, hopefully without getting pedantic and sounding like I'm just being slow. And Lois. So if you happen to be doing this presentation in a Zoom meeting, I have good news for you. There is a live stream button at the bottom. You can click. Anyone can then have that on if it helps. But more importantly, at the end of the session, you can say to people, now if you go to that little button, click on the arrow, you can get full transcript. You can save that thing. And that means that they can read it at home afterwards. If there's something that they really were interested in, didn't quite get, it's not great, but hey, it's there. Next question. Brandon Burnt Buttram, it looks like in Indianapolis, Indiana says, not really a question, but just wanted to share that as a generally anxious person, I found that my confidence in public speaker got, speaking got a little better after taking an improvisation class. Alex. Yeah, I would argue that it's, it's less about the imp improvisation class and, mo and more about the practice. <laughs> so the best thing to get better, I mean, many of us, uh, especially those in radio, I typically did 100 to 200 pretty bad shows, you know, as we as we kind of figured out how we were going to do this. And so I think that that's one of the things that you want to uh, consider is is practice. And, and again, that's something that like, for instance, this panel provides is the ability to practice after hours, the uh, weekend office hours and then office hours provides a place where you have to think on your feet a lot. And uh, and it's, it's a relatively forgiving place to to do that. Jason. As the proud owner of at least 200 terrible shows before I found my voice, I, I completely agree. There are a lot of reasons that people can clam up and, and be anxious on stage. The, the odd part is, I, I think I, I'm not the only one on, on the panel who thinks he's an extrovert, but at the same time despises being in the room with a bunch of strangers. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, okay. All right, I don't know any of these people. Like, I'm just, I've got to go make friends. Like, I thought this was supposed to be fun and recreational. If you don't, if you don't understand why you're freezing up, it, improv and the yes and part of it will absolutely fix a lot of your comfort with yourself and how, you know, how dynamically you can push and pull an audience. Next question. Liberty White in Atlanta says, how much time do you spend preparing clients who are first time speakers? Nigel? 
Yeah, if this, if this is a first-time speaker and it's really important that they are successful and communicate, I wouldn't prepare them. I would interview, well, I would prepare them, but I wouldn't prepare them to speak. I would try and interview them. I really want to get the most out of them, and that may be the best way. Alex? Yeah, I, I, we try to get them to go through a lot of this stuff. A lot of it is them understanding what's going to happen and practice it and practice it so they understand. And the most important thing for almost all events is how do you get in and how do you get out? So it's the infill and the exfill <laughs> are the are the things that you have to figure out. And we rehearse a lot. Once if they get in well, a lot of times people will do pretty well. Um, it's when they have a bad start that people get off balance and then they can stay off balance the entire show. Jeffrey. A lot of the times I'm in a situation where I don't get to prepare any of the clients as, as we go into what we're going to do. So I make sure that I have the information for them so they can read it at their leisure. They can, I have a video that I send that they can watch it at their leisure. And if, if they have a handler, uh, I try to get with the handler or the PR person or whatever and tell them this is the important stuff. Give them the documentation and the video. Tell them to watch it and, and read through it and make sure that their client is ready for that presentation as well. And then of course just hope for the best that somebody's read and saw and, and decided to practice what was uh, what was suggested. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, one American company lost a client with the use of the expression, this is a whole new ball game. The client didn't consider it a game. When do you use national colloquialisms with international audiences? Great question. Nigel. Uh, almost never would be the answer to that question. And uh, particularly when it's an analogy and even more specifically when it's an American football analogy, which makes no sense to most people outside of America. <laughs> Courtney. Yeah, I would say uh, never. Uh, avoiding colloquialisms or idioms, as Alex said er earlier, idiomatic speech, you know, because phrases like, oh, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here, but, you know, may mean make completely perplex people that have English as a second language and have never heard that idiomatic speech. So avoid uh, speaking in metaphors, avoid speaking uh, in colloquialisms that are relate to only you. Never use uh, sports analogies, speaking to a technical conference. Jeffrey. And know your audience, of course. Uh, if you decide that you want to use this, uh, this, this quote, then you can just basically say, and you know, we say this in America, this is a whole new ball game, and that could actually change everything for how they uh, how they perceive what you just said. Uh, in this case, I'm kind of wondering if the client was ready to, or had one foot out the door to begin with, and then they, they just cho uh, chose that as the uh, as the reason why they they left this company. Jason. Courtney nailed it. If sports analogies are your cap and trade, slay your darlings. Just get rid of them. Next question. Fleety in Bali, Indonesia is back with any ideas on principles to build engagement when speaking. Have you? Did you ever consider? Was there a moment when you? And so forth. For me, at least, it's quite challenging to speak to an audience to connect deeply without engaging their experiences. Without, yeah, without you. Alex? That's why almost all, all of mine are conversations. And again, I literally start most of my, my presentations with I'm not a very good speaker. And I, this will be really short if you don't ask any questions. Um, and so I, I kind of set that up and, and do everything I can to give them permission. The one venturous person that raises their hand immediately grab onto that <laughs> because it starts to build that positive reinforcement. Next question. Steve Buchan, Vancouver, Canada, says, when presenting to a large audience in Asia, where there were folks from all over the region with the director and cameras knowing, I walked off stage into the audience to capture engagement. Anyone else do this? Jeffrey. Yeah, I did that once. It was it was kind of fun, but uh, it's, it's also, you also don't know where, where things are going. You, you said that you talked to everybody and they, they were fine with it. But uh, you know that uh, if there's like translators and things like that trying to, uh, to translate your, your information, uh, if they lose track of where you are, that can, that can make for a, a very interesting situation. Plus, if something happens while you're out in the audience, that can completely uh, thwart your whole uh, presentation. Like if somebody was to stand on the table and, and yell at you, which probably won't happen, but you never know. Alex? Yeah, from a... 
engagement perspective, I think that it's a popular thing to do. And if you're really good at it and you're really tall, uh, it works out really well. Like Tony Robbins is really good at it, but he also is six foot seven. Um, and so it, it works out well logistically from as a person who works on these events. It's a disaster. Like it is a disaster. It is bad lighting, bad audio. It is um, bad framing. You know, like if, if you if you actually think that if there's an online audience that's that's watching this, never walk off the stage because the stage is a nice, safe place that look that where you look good. In fact, you shouldn't even pace on the stage. You find I, we, we for the best speakers, we spike them, which means that there's little X marks walk during while you're talking about this and stop here and stop here you know why it's because we built camera positions for those those spikes you know there's camera positions and there's beautiful lighting and we just tell people you're going to look great if you stand here you're going to look horrible if you stand over here or you won't look as good and so you know walking it's a very popular thing and especially people who watch tony robbins a lot but he's really good like you can't follow almost any of what he does as a rule because He's Tony Robbins. Right. <laughs> like, exception you know, like, to so, the rule. He's an exception to almost all the rules. And so <laughs> so don't watch him and go, oh, that's, that's what I should do. Uh, you have to be exceptionally good at it. You can walk into the audience, as I said, but um, I would be I would do it very sparingly unless you really know what you're doing. And again, if you're not if you're streaming, never leave the stage. Bill? Yeah, my what everybody said, my standard thing to any speaker who wants to do that is, oh, really? You're going to put that much extra pressure on yourself? Because, yes, you're going to walk out of the light. I'm going to have a bad shot for that whole line that you wanted to connect with everybody. Or you're going to do the, the biggest sin, which is there's a front projection on, and you're going to go stand with half your face in the projection from the slide such that I have no way to recover this shot. It's going to be truly ugly, whatever I do, for as long as you stand in that awful position. So... Yeah. If you look back at your production crew, you'll see this. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, like, just like, you know, like they're, they're, they're either doing that or they're thinking it. <laughs> when the question was read in my head, I was just like, why? Why? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next. He says, when presenting in an environment where real-time captioning or interpretation is used, what considerations must the presenter make? Alex? Rehearsal. <laughs> Like if you're presenting, um, the big thing for you to think about, it, you're not really going to do anything different in your presentation because there's interpretation uh, or captioning. But rehearsal is very important because they are figuring out, oh, I don't understand. I don't know what that word means in this language. Or I, you know, I have to add this to my library for the stenographer. So there's a lot of things that they have to do. And so if you're going to um, do those things, rehearsal is the most important thing. Lois. If you're talking about the live captioning here in Zoom, one of the things is to speak a little bit more distinctly because the transcription is mechanical and it's not always terribly good. But if you have your articulation clear, it makes it easier for the mechanical translation to understand you. As far as any other things, as people have said, don't use idiom, don't use giant words when a small word will do. Uh, jargon is frequently difficult to translate correctly and easily. That's right. Keep it simple. Next question. George Butters has our last one. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Lawrence Lessig's TED Talk presentations included words on a large screen. Between one and five words at most, very large white text on black screen. Comments? Courtney? Well, I, I haven't read this as an exact as an exact scientific principle but i think there's a certain amount of of uh, brain chemistry that goes on when you're you perceive a word visually that you're hearing at the same time so your your brain is receiving two inputs it's receiving that word as a word to read and you're hearing that word at the same time it's very difficult to pull off in sync and it only works when it's in sync as each word appears as the person speaks it and i think it releases some type of endorphins in the brain and it and it just uh piques your interest and i think you have dual pathways into understanding and uh when those two things are in sync i think it just really amplifies the point a lot more bill well, it's just a couple little things I thought of because um, we've talked a lot about this, but uh, I was trained in billboards because we used to have to write them and seven words is all you get because it's 60 miles an hour on a freeway. There's no more time for somebody to absorb a message than that. When, when you put a few words on screen, I always remember myself, okay, I put a very few words up on screen to make a point, but I can't leave it up there. I can't be that have that be the, the main graphic for three minutes. That's insane because 
people just don't have that much attention span. The other thing is interesting to me is watching the latest Apple keynotes and everybody always, um, you know, understands that they spend more time and effort than anyone in there. One, the one thing they do now is put up images of things that I think have multiple levels. They do word clouds sometimes. They also do things like the die of the new chip coming out. And then they indicate, okay, we've got 10 different cores here. They're giving you two messages at once through the use of that graphic. They're giving you some sense of what it is, but they're also giving you the scale upon which they are working emphasizing the fact that they are at the leading edge of nanotechnology in terms of these traces and these chips. So it's never just one thing you're trying to do. They're brilliant about making a slide do multiple things for multiple parts of their audience. Alex? Yeah, the, the, Apple's the gold standard. Like when it comes to presentations, the two companies that are probably the best at it are Apple and Salesforce as far as the design goes. So if you watch their their slides, they're probably the cleanest and the most effective slides. And, and, they, and as a company, I think they probably both spend, I'm guessing, the most amount of time on those slides. So um, uh, and so I think that I would uh, look at those as, as some gold standards. I think that putting up single images can work. Um, there is, I keep my sl slides moving a lot. So I, I do everything progressively too. So I'm putting up what I'm talking about as I'm talking about it. I don't put up, I don't put up stuff in the future or in the past. Um, I, as I'm talking about it, it comes up. And so, you know, progressively adding things to the slide and then changing slides is something I do a lot. And Courtney. Yeah, one of the pioneers of doing this was of course, uh, the example of Bob Dylan in Subterranean Homesick Blues, where if you've seen this video and I won't play it here for reasons of copyright infringement uh he goes through all and you know it's hard to understand bob dylan in the first place and there are so many lyrics in that song it's almost impossible to follow but in the video he's pulling cards and he's hitting every highlighted word as he's saying it and it uh, really emphasizes and lets you learn the song which has an incredible number of lyrics well, there we have it. We've come to the end of another show. Thank you all producers for your fantastic questions. Of course, to the panelists, thank you for being here. Without both of you all parties, um, this show would not be possible. So go ahead now and let's hop into After Hours. <laughs>